Um, thank you. I'm Nicolas Dandrimont, and I will indeed be talking to you about software heritage. Uh, I'm a software engineer uh, for this project. I've been working on it for three years now. And we'll see what this thing is all about. Yeah, I guess the batteries are out. So. So let's try that again. Um, so we all know uh, we've been doing free software for a while that uh, software source code is something uh, special. Why is that? Um, as Howard Haberson has said in uh, SICP, uh, his textbook on programming, uh, programs are made to be read by people and then incidentally by for machines to execute. So basically what software source code provides us is a way inside the mind of the designer of the program. Uh, for instance, uh, you can have, like, you can get insights in uh, very crazy algorithms that can do uh, very fast reverse uh, square roots for uh, 3D uh, kind of stuff. Uh, so, like in the Quake 2 uh, source code, uh, you can also get insights on the algorithms that are underpinning the internet. For instance, using seeing the NetQ algorithm in the Linux kernel. So yeah. Um, what we're building uh, as the free software community is the free software commons. Basically the commons is all the cultural and uh, social and natural resources that we share and that everyone has access to. And more specifically, the software commons is what we're building uh, with software that is open and that is available for all to use, to modify, to execute, to distribute. We know that those commons are a really critical part of our commons. Who's taking care of it? The software is fragile. Like all digital information, you can lose software. Um, people can decide to shut down hosting spaces uh, because of business decisions. Uh, people can hack into uh, software uh, hosting platforms and remove the code uh, maliciously or just inadvertently. Um, and of course, for the obsolete stuff, uh, there's rot. Uh, if you don't care about the data, then it rots and it decays and you lose it. So, where is the archive we go to when something is lost, when GitLab goes away, when GitHub goes away? Where do we go? Finally, there's one last uh, thing that we noticed, is that there's a lot and lots of teams that work on research on software. And there's no real big infrastructure for research on code. Um, there's tons of critical issues around code, uh, safety, security, verification, proofs. Nobody is doing this at a very large scale. Uh, if you want to see the stars, you go to the Atacama Desert and you point a telescope at the sky. Where is the telescope for source code? And that's what Software Heritage wants to be. Um, what we do is we collect, we preserve, and we, and we share all the software that is publicly available. Why do we do that? We do that to preserve the past, to enhance the present, and to prepare for the future. So what we're building is a base infrastructure that can be used for cultural heritage, for industry, for research, and for education purposes. How do we do it? We do it with an open approach. Uh, every single line of code that we write is free software. Um, we do it transparently. 
uh, everything that we do, uh, we do it in the open, uh, be that on a mailing list or on our issue tracker. And we strive to do it for the very long haul. So we do it with replication in mind, so that no single entity has full control over the data that we collect. And we do it in a non-profit fashion, so that we avoid um, business-driven decisions impacting the project. So what do we do concretely? We do archiving of version control systems. What does that mean? It means we archive file contents, so source code files. We archive revisions, which means all the metadata of the history of the projects, we try to we try to download it and we put it inside a common data model that is um, shared across all the archive. We archive releases of the software, uh, releases that have been tagged in a version control system, as well as releases that we can find as tables, uh, because sometimes both views of this source code differ. Um, and of course, we archive where and when we've seen the data that we've collected. And all of this we put inside a um, canonical VCS agnostic data model. So if you have a Debian package with its history, if you have a Git repository, if you have a subversion repository, if you have a Mercurial repository, it all looks the same and you can work on it with the same tools. What we don't do is archive um, what's around the software, for instance, the bug tracking systems, or the home pages, or the wikis, or the mailing lists. There are some projects that work in this space. Uh, for instance, the Internet Archive does a lot of very good work around archiving uh, the web. Uh, so our goal is not to replace them, but to work with them and uh, be able to do linking uh, across all the archives that exist. Uh, we can, for instance, uh, for the mailing lists, uh, there's the Gmail project that does a lot of archiving of uh, free software mailing lists. So our long-term vision is to play a part in a semantic Wikipedia of software, or Wikidata of software, uh, where we can hyperlink all the archives that exist and do stuff in the area. So, a uh, quick tour of our infrastructure. So basically, um, all the way to the right is um, our archive. Uh, so our archive consists of a huge uh, graph of all the metadata about uh, the files, the directories, the revisions, the commits, and the releases, and all the projects that are on top of the, of the graph. Um, we separate the file storage into another object storage uh, because of the size discrepancy. Uh, we have a lot lots and lots of file contents that we need to store. Uh, so we do that outside of the database that is used to store the graph. So basically what we archive is a set of software origins uh, that are uh, Git repositories, Mercurial repositories, uh, etc, etc. So all those origins are loaded uh, on a regular schedule. So if there is a very active software origin. We are going to archive it uh, more often than stale uh, things that don't get uh, a lot of updates. And so what we do to get the list of software origins that we archive, we have a bunch of listers that can like scroll uh, through the list of repositories, for instance, on GitHub or other uh, hosting platforms. Uh, we have code that can read uh, Debian archive metadata to make a list of the packages that are uh, inside this archive and can be uh, can be archived. Um, 
etc. Cetera, et cetera. So all of this is done on a regular basis. Um, we are currently working on some kind of push mechanism so that people or um, other systems can notify us of updates. Uh, our goal is not to do real-time archiving. Uh, we really need it for the long run. Uh, but we still want to be able to prioritize stuff that um, people tell us is important to archive. Um, the Internet Archive has a Save Now button, and we want to implement something along those lines as well. So if we know that some software project is in danger for a reason or another, then we can prioritize uh, archiving it. So this is the basic structure of a revision in the Software Heritage Archive. Um, you'll see that it's very similar to a git commit. Uh, it's just like, so the format of the metadata uh, is pretty much uh, what you'll find in a git commit uh, with some extensions that you don't see here because this is from a git commit. Um, so basically what we do is we take the like identifier of the um, of the directory that the revision points to, we take the identifier of the parent of the revision, so we can keep track of the history, and then we add some metadata uh, of our chip and uh, committership information, and then revision message, and then we take a hash of this. It makes an identifier that's um, probably unique. Um, very, very probably unique. Um, and so using those identifiers, we can retrace all the origins, uh, all, the, all the history of development of the project, and we can deduplicate across all the archive. Uh, all, the, all the identifiers are intrinsic, which means that we uh, compute them from the contents of the things that we are uh, archiving which means that we can deduplicate very efficiently across uh, well, all the data that we archive. And how much data do we archive? Uh, a bit. So we have uh, passed the billion revision mark uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, this graph is a bit old, but anyway, uh, you have a live graph on our website. Um, so that's more of more than four and a half billion unique source code files. Um, we don't actually discriminate between what we would consider as source code and what upstream developers consider as source code. So everything that's in a Git repository we consider as source code. Uh, if it's below a size threshold. Uh, 100, uh, so, uh, billion revisions across 80 million projects. So what do we archive? Uh, we archive GitHub, we archive Debian. Um, so Debian, we run uh, the archival process every day. So every day we get the new packages that have been uploaded in the archive. GitHub, we try to keep up. Um, we are currently working on some uh, performance improvements and some scalability improvements to make sure that we can keep up with the development on GitHub. Um, we have uh, archived uh, as a one-off thing uh, the former contents of Gitorius and Google Code, uh, which are two prominent uh, code hosting spaces that closed recently. And we've been working uh, on archiving the contents of Bitbucket, um, which is kind of a challenge because the API is a bit buggy uh, and Atlassian isn't too interested in fixing it. Um, so in uh, concrete storage terms, uh, we have 175 terabytes of blobs. Uh, so the files take 175 terabytes. And kind of big database, uh, six terabytes. So the database only contains the graph of like the metadata uh, for the archive, which is a, basically an eight billion uh, nodes and 70 billion edges uh, graph. And of course, it's growing daily. We, we are pretty sure this is the richest public source code archive that's available now, and it keeps growing. 
So how uh, do we actually, uh, so what kind of stack do we use uh, to store uh, all this? Um, we use Debian, of course. Uh, all, all our deployment recipes are in Puppet, uh, in public repositories. We've started using Ceph uh, for the blob storage. Uh, we use PostgreSQL for the metadata storage uh, with some of the standard tools that live around PostgreSQL for backups and replication. Um, we use a uh, standard Python stack for um, scheduling of jobs and for web uh, interface stuff. So basically, uh, Psycho PG2 for the low level stuff, Django for the uh, web stuff, um, and Celery for the scheduling uh, of jobs. In house, we've written an ad hoc object storage system which has a bunch of backends that you can use. So basically, uh, we are agnostic between a Unix file system, uh, Azure, uh, Ceph or tons of other things. It's a really simple uh, object storage system where you can just put an object, get an object, put a bunch of objects, get a bunch of objects. And we've implemented removal, uh, but we don't really use it yet. Um, all the data model implementation, uh, all the listers, the loaders, the schedulers, everything has been written uh, by us. Uh, it's a pile of Python code. Um, so basically 20 Python packages and around 30 Puppet modules to deploy all that. And we've done everything as a copyleft uh, license. Uh, so GPLv3 for the backend and a GPLv3 for the frontend. So even if people uh, try and make their own uh, software heritage using our code, uh, they have to publish their changes. Uh, Hardware-wise, um, we run for now everything on a few hypervisors uh, in-house, and uh, our main storage is currently still on a very high density, very slow, very bulky uh, storage array. But we've started to migrate off this um, this thing uh, into a Ceph storage cluster which we're going to grow uh, as we need uh, in the next few months. Uh, we've also been um, granted by Microsoft some sponsorship, uh, in-kind sponsorship uh, for their cloud services. So we've started putting mirrors of everything uh, in their infrastructure as well, uh, which means a full object storage mirror, uh, so 170 terabytes of stuff uh, mirrored on Azure. Uh, as well as a database mirror for uh, graph. And we are also doing uh, all the content indexing and all the things that need like uh, scalability uh, on Azure now. Um, so yeah. And finally, at the University of Bologna, uh, we have a backend storage for the download. So currently, uh, our main storage is quite slow, so if you want to download a bundle of things that we've archived, then we actually keep a cache of what we've done um, so that it doesn't take a million years to download stuff. We do our development uh, in a classic uh, free and open source software way, so we talk on a mailing list, uh, on, a, on IRC, uh, on a forge, uh, everything is in English. Everything's in public. Uh, there's more information on our website if you want to actually have a look and see what we do. So, uh, all that's very interesting, but how do we actually look into it? So, one of the ways uh, that you can browse and that you can use the archive is using a REST API. So basically, this API allows you to do point-wise browsing of the archive. So you can go and follow the links in the graph, which is very slow, uh, but gives you uh, pretty much full access of the, uh, for the data. So there's an index for the API that you can look at, but that's not really convenient. 
So we also have a web user interface. Um, it's in preview right now. Uh, we're gonna go. We're gonna do a full launch uh, in the month of June. So if you go to archive.softwareheritage.org/browse uh, with the given credentials, um, well, you can have a look and um, see what's going on. Basically, we have a, a web interface that allows you to um, look at what origins we have downloaded, when we have downloaded the origins, and uh, so with a, <coughs> with a kind of graph view uh, of how often we've visited the origins, and a calendar view of when we have visited the origins. And then inside the visits, you can actually browse the contents that we've archived. So for instance, this is the Python repository uh, as of May 2017. Um, and you can have the list of files and then drill down. Uh, it uh, should be pretty intuitive. Uh, if you look at the history of a project, you can see the differences between two revisions of a project. Um, oh no, that's the syntax highlighting. But anyway, the diffs arrive right after. So yeah, um, pretty cool stuff. Uh, I should be able to do a demo as well. Uh, it's gonna be, yeah, should work. Gonna try. Um. Yeah. I'm gonna zoom in. So this is the main archive. Uh, you can see some statistics about the objects that we've downloaded. Uh, when you zoom in, uh, you get uh, some kind of overflows because, yeah, why would you do that? Uh, if we want to browse, uh, we can try to find a, an origin. Um, uh, GDPC. Okay. Um, so there's lots and lots of like random GitHub forks of things. Um, we don't discriminate and we don't really uh, like filter uh, what we what we download. Uh, we're looking into doing some relevance uh, kind of sorting of the results um, here. Um, blah, blah, blah. Next. Uh, Xilinx, why not? Uh, so this has been downloaded for the last time on the 3rd of August 2016, so it's probably a dead repository. Um, but yeah, you can see a bunch of source code. Uh, you can read the readme of the uh, GDPC. Um, so if we go back to a more interesting origin, uh, here's the repository for Git. Um, I've selected voluntarily an old uh, visit of the repo uh, so that we can see what was going on then. And then, so uh, if I look at the calendar view, uh, yeah, you can see that we've had some issues actually updating this, but anyway. <laughs> If I look at the last visit, then we can actually browse the contents. We can get syntax highlighting as well. Uh, this is a big make file with lots of comments. Yeah. Let's see what the actual source code. Anyway, so that's the browsing interface. Uh, we can also now get back what we've archived and download it, which is kind of something that you might want to do if a repository is lost. You can actually download it and get the source code back again. So how we do that, uh, if you go on the top right of this browsing interface, you have actions and download. And you can download the directory. 
that you're currently looking at. Um, so it's an asynchronous process, uh, which means that if uh, there's a lot of load and it's going to take some time uh, to get actually to be able to download the content. So you can put in your email address so we can notify you when the download is ready. I'm going to try my luck and say just OK. And yeah, it's going to appear at some point uh, in the list of things that I've requested. Um, but yeah, uh, I've already requested some things to download that I can actually get and open as a table. Yeah. Can you please? Yeah, I think that's the thing that I was actually looking at, which is this revision of the Git source code. And then I can do, I can open it. Yay, Emacs. That's when you want. Yay, source code. Yeah. So this seems to work. And then, of course, if you want to actually script what you're doing. There's an API that allows you to do the downloads as well. So you can. So the source code is deduplicated a lot, uh, which means that uh, for one single repository, you get tons of files that we, we have to collect uh, if, you want to, uh, if you want to actually download an archive of a directory. So takes a while. Uh, but we have an asynchronous uh, API. So you can post the identifier of a revision uh, to this URL and then get such updates. And at some point, it will tell you that uh, the, so here, the status will tell you that uh, the object is available. You can download it. And you can even download the full history of a project and get that as a git fast export uh, archive that you can re-import into a new git uh, repository. So any kind of VCS that we've imported, you can export as a git repository and re-import uh, on your machine. So how to get involved in the project? Um, we have a lot of features that we're interested in. Uh, a lot of them are uh, now in early access or have been done. Uh, there's some stuff that we would like help with. Um, this is some stuff that we're working on, uh, provenance information. So you have a content, you want to know which repository it comes from. That's something that we're working on. Uh, full text search, uh, if you want I mean, the end goal is to be able even to trace a source of snippets of code that have been copied from one project to another. Uh, that's something that we can look into with the wealth of information that we have inside the archive. Um, there's a lot of things that, I mean, uh, there's a lot of things that people want to do with the archive. Uh, our goal is to enable people to do things, to do interesting things with uh, a lot of source code. So yeah, if you have an idea of what you'd want to do with such an archive, please, you can come talk to us and yeah, we would be happy to help you, help us. <laughs> so yeah, what we want to do is to diversify the sources of things that we archive. Uh, currently, we have good support for Git. Uh, we have OK support for Subversion and Mercurial. Um, if your project of choice is in another version control system, uh, we're going to miss it. So yeah, uh, people can contribute in this area. Uh, if for the listing part, uh, we have coverage of Debian, we have coverage of GitHub. Um, if your code is somewhere else, we won't see it. So we need people to contribute uh, stuff that can list, for instance, GitLab instances. Um, and then we can integrate that in our infrastructure and actually have people 
be able to archive uh, their GitLab instances. And of course, uh, we need to spread the word, uh, make the project sustainable. We have a few sponsors now. Um, uh, Microsoft, Nokia, Huawei, uh, GitHub uh, has joined as a sponsor. Uh, the University of Bologna, uh, of course, INRIA uh, is sponsoring, but we need to uh, keep spreading the word and keep uh, keep the project sustainable. And of course, we need to like save endangered source code. And for that, we have a suggestion box on the wiki uh, that you can add things to. Uh, for instance. Uh, we have in the back of our minds archiving SourceForge because we know that this isn't very uh, sustainable and it's at risk of being uh, taken down at some point. So if you want to join us, uh, we also have uh, some job openings uh, that are available. Uh, for now, it's in Paris. Uh, so if you want to consider uh, coming work with us in Paris, then you can look into that. So, yeah, that's Software Heritage. Uh, we are building a reference archive of all the free software that's been ever written in an international, open, non-profit and mutualized infrastructure that we have opened up to everyone. Uh, all users, vendors, developers can use it. And the idea is to be at the service of the community and for society uh, as a whole. So if you want to join us, you can look at our website, you can look at our code, and you can also talk to me. So if you have any questions, I think we have about 10, 12 minutes for questions. Do you have a question? How do you protect the archive against stuff that you don't want to have in the archive? I can think of A, stuff that is copyright protected and that GitHub will also s delete after a while, or if I would uh, misuse the archive as my private backup and store encrypted blocks on GitHub and you will eventually backup them for me. So, um, there's, I think, two sides of the question. Uh, the first side is, uh, do we really archive only uh, stuff that is free software and that we can redistribute? And how do we uh, manage, um, for instance, copyright takedown stuff? So, um, currently, so most of the infrastructure of the project is under French law. Uh, there's a defined process to do copyright uh, takedown uh, in the French uh, in the French legal system. Um, we would be really annoyed to have to take down content uh, from the archive. Um, what we do, however, is to mirror public information that is publicly available. Uh, of course, I'm not a like, uh, lawyer for the project, so I can't really... Um, like I'm not 100% sure of what I'm about to say, but um, what I know is that in the current French legislation status, if the source of the data is still available, so for instance, if the data is still on GitHub, then you need to have GitHub take it down before we have to take it down. Um, if um, we are not currently filtering content for misuse of the archive, so the only thing that we do is that we put a limit on the size of the files that are archived in Software Heritage. Uh, the limit is pretty high, like 100 megabytes or something. Um, we can't really like decide ourselves what is source code, what is not source code, uh, because, for instance, if your uh, if your project is a cryptography library, you might want to have some encrypted blocks of data that are stored in uh, your 
source code repository as test fixtures. And then you need them to build the code and to make sure that it works. So how would that be any different than your encrypted backup uh, on GitHub? How could we, uh, Software Heritage, distinguish between proper use and misuse of uh, the resources? So. I guess our long-term goal is to not have to care about uh, misuse because it's going to be a drop in the ocean. Um, we're going to have so much, uh, well, we want to have enough space and enough resources that we don't really need to ask ourselves this question, basically. Um, thanks. Other questions? Uh, have you looked at uh, auth uh, uh, some form of uh, authentication to provide additional assurance that the uh, archived source code hasn't been uh, modified or tampered with in uh, some form? So, uh, first of all, all the identifiers for the objects that are inside the archive uh, are cryptogra cryptographic hashes of the contents that we've archived. So, for Files, for instance, we take uh, the SHA-1, the SHA-256, the one of the Blake hashes, um, and the git uh, modified SHA-1 uh, of the file, and we use that in the manifests for the directories. So the directories, the directory identifiers are a hash of the manifest of the list of files that are inside the directory. Uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So recursively, you can uh, make sure that the data uh, that we give back to you has not been uh, at least altered um, by um, like bit flip or uh, anything. So we regularly run a scrub of the data that we have in the archive. So we make sure that uh, there's no rot inside our archive. We've not looked into um, basically attestation of, uh, for instance, uh, making sure that the code that we've downloaded um, I mean, we, we're not doing anything more than taking a picture of the data and we say, we've computed this hash. Maybe uh, the code that's been presented by GitHub to Software Heritage is different than what you've uploaded to GitHub. We can't tell. Um, in the case of Git, uh, you can always use the identifiers of the objects that you've pushed. Uh, so you have the commit hash, which is in itself a cryptographic identifier of the contents of the commit. Um, in turn, if the commit is signed, then uh, the signature is still stored in the software heritage metadata, and you can like reproduce uh, the original Git object and check the signature. But we've not done anything specific uh, for software heritage in this, in this area. Does that answer your question? Cool. Other questions? There's one in front. <coughs> so it's partially question, partially comment. Uh, so I your initial idea was to have a telescope or something like this for source code. Yes. For now, for me, it looks like a little bit more like microscope, so you can focus on one thing, but but not much. So have you started thinking about how to analyze entire ecosystem or something like this. F for example, now we have Django 2, which is Python 3 only, so it would be interesting to look at all Django models to see when they start moving to this Django. So we would need to start analyzing thousands or yeah. millions of, uh, of files, but then we would need to use some SQL-like or some MapReduce jobs or something like mm. this for this. Yes, so uh, we've started. Um, so the, the two initiators of the project, uh, Roberto Di Cosmo and Stefano Sacchioli, are both researchers in computer science. Uh, so they have a strong background in actually uh, mining software repositories and uh, doing some 
large scale analysis on source code. Um, we've been talking with research groups whose uh, main goal is to do analysis on large scale, uh, large scale source code archives. Um, one of the first uh, mirrors, uh, so outside, outside of our control of the archive, will be in Grenoble. Uh, there's, a l there's a few teams that work on uh, actually uh, doing large-scale research on source code uh, over there. So that's what the mirror will be used for. Um, we've also been looking at uh, what the Google open source team does. Uh, they have like this big repository with all the code that Google uses and they've started to push back um, like do uh, large scale analysis of uh, security vulnerabilities of like issues uh, with uh, static and dynamic analysis of the code and they've started pushing their uh, fixes upstream so that's something that we want to enable users to do that's not something that we want to do ourselves but we want to make sure that people can do it using our archive so we'd be happy to work with people who already do that so that they can use their knowledge and their tools inside our uh, archive. Does that answer your question? Cool. Any more questions? No? Then thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you.